So do I need to be even closer still? You're good. I'm right. Oh, and we're recording. This is the Improved Photography Podcast, episode 138. Today's podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or your online store. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter offer code IMPROVE at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace, build it beautiful. Hey everybody and welcome back to the Improved Photography Podcast. You are joined by thousands of photographers across the world and today I am joined by Brian McGuckin and Nick Page. How are you doing guys? Doing well. Doing well. Good. Good to have you on board. This is a kind of an experiment. We just w grabbed some user questions, put them together, and we're going to jump right into the first one without any delay. The first one is from Joseph Leland, of hopefully, or Joseph Land. He says, hi, gr group. I'm having trouble focus stacking in Photoshop, so I'm going to send this one to Nick first. The most important, um, I import into Lightroom as layers, and I align them and auto blend the layers. The trouble is that the masking does a very poor job, especially around flowers. Um, it doesn't take the the max the right mask around the edges. Is anyone else having this problem, or what are the best ways to focus stack? So, what would you recommend to Joseph, Nick? <clears throat> well, he's doing everything right as far as um, loading them up as layers, doing the auto align, and then auto blend. I think that the problem probably lies with either the number of images that he's trying to stack. Um, if you're trying to stack too few with too shallow of a depth of field. Um, the, the software just isn't going to have enough to work with. So you want to make sure that you're taking um, plenty of photos. Also, you know, the deeper the aperture that you're doing this at, the easier the time the software is going to have. So if you're trying to shoot it at like wide open f2.8 or something and you're really close to something, um, the, the software is just going to have a really hard time with that. So you want to make sure that um, you're shooting in a deeper depth of field, like F11 to, you know, F16 or something like that. So I think that would be in my advice. Make sure you're shooting with a deeper depth of field. Make sure that you're using enough frames when you're doing your focus stack. So what what is enough frames? Because I've never done it yet. It, well, it totally depends on, you know, like if you're super close with with a 50 millimeter lens to like a flower that's like inches from your camera and you're wanting to stack all the way back to the to the background you're gonna need a lot and by a lot I would mean like 10 photos probably because you're dealing with such a short a shallow depth of field because of how close you are to the subject they that you need to get more frames in order to get everything from the foreground to the background sharp because it, if you think about it if you're dealing with a shallow depth of field and you get like four frames in all of that, there's going to be areas in between where you focused that are not focused. So you're going to end up with like sharp, blurry, sharp, blurry, sharp, blurry, like throughout your depth of field. So that would be weird. So you want to make sure that you're taking enough shots and, and changing the, you know, the focus point in between each one. And what aperture do you recommend? Um, the deeper the better, so like f8, f11, usually f22. that's... F22, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> evil. <laughs> so like f8, f11, that's where your lens is typically the sharpest, so that that's kind of the whole point of focus stacking is to use that sharpest part of your of your lens, and that'll also give you the, the software enough depth of field to work with when it goes to stack all those images together. Very good point. And the next question we have is from Paul Bickley, and he says, how do you mix flash and ambient light at parties? Um, so the glow from the candles and fairy lights are, are not uh, overpowered by the flash. Um, are there any certain settings that you use? Um, Nick, Brian, who wants to jump in on this one first? Well, I'll start out, and then Nick will correct me probably. <laughs> But uh, usually a lot of it just has to do with just the uh, your shutter speed. Uh, the shutter speed, you know, allows the ambient light in. And if you ex if you um, expose to the ambient light, then uh, you should be okay with that because the flash is gonna is gonna do what it's gonna do. Yeah. Is there, I, is there a more geeky way to explain that, Nick? <clears throat> well, actually, no. Um, yeah, you're you're pretty much right on. You want to start with your ambient light. So when, before you start mixing any flash in, start by getting the, the ambient light right in your camera with your settings. 
when you get it close, it's still a little bit dim, but you know, pretty close to where you still are getting enough ambient light in, then start adding flash. And most likely in those kind of situations, you're going to have your flash power pretty low. And uh, just, just be prepared for that. Um, so yeah, just try not to overpower the ambient light because that, that's what gives it its ambience. Very cool. And Caleb Chamberlain, and I'm going to do my best to not butcher names from now on, says, hey, y'all, um, this is one of five shots that I took on uh, my Sony A7S, or A7S the other night, and we can't see this because he just posted the question. Um, I was just wondering if anyone had any suggestions for selling printed landscapes, and if so, could they share their tips? So what are your go-to tips for printing landscapes? Mine's to get the shot sharp. Um, that way, if it gets blown up to a larger print, it's not going to show those imperfections. I mean, you can get away with a small print of a, a landscape and have relatively soft focus, but if you start blowing up landscapes huge like Nick is doing, you're going to notice those sharpness issues right away. So what are some other tips you throw in, Nick? Well, and it looks like he's really wondering about how, how to go about selling printed landscape photos. Okay. And so when it comes to selling, you just have to get it in front of eyeballs. The more eyeballs, the better. <laughs> and, and also try to get them in a place where people are actually in the mood to spend money. Um, I, I know I was on Brian's show, and we had talked a little bit about uh, selling art and, and getting gallery showings and stuff. And, and I, I've, I've shown stuff at places like coffee shops, wineries, wine tasting rooms, banks, restaurants, and like, for example, at the winery, um, people, it's typically a, a demographic that has a little bit of extra money to spend, and they have a little bit of booze in them, and it kind of loosens up their pocketbook and lubricates it, so they're, they're, they're not afraid to spend a few bucks on a, on a print. But at a bank, for example, people are not at all interested in spending money. They're going in to actually save it. So um, putting, putting your art in front of eyeballs and putting your art in front of the right eyeballs, those are the biggest things um, that I can recommend as far as selling prints. Just get them, get them up in, in restaurants and coffee shops and, and you know lounges, stuff like that. And uh, the more people you can get it in front of, the, the better luck you'll have um, selling some. Yeah, and I also think the rarity of the print as well. Like I think you mentioned on that same podcast that you usually are taking a lot of shots, so that equals you're not printing that print a bunch of times, so you can actually tell someone, you know, this print isn't going to be replicated 5 million times. So having that exclusive look at this Nick Page shot probably also helps people want to buy it as well, would you say? Yeah, and, you know, another thing that I do is I because I have so many people on my Facebook friends list, um, I do oh, Facebook Mr. Popular. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so popular. But I, I do Facebook auctions where I say, okay, uh, today I'm going to auction off this 12 by 18 metal print. Um, the bidding ends on Friday, and let's start the bidding at 50 bucks. And whoever comments with the highest bid um, gets the print. And I, it's always a guaranteed sell. Sometimes I will make more money than I would have asked for if I was just hanging it somewhere. Sometimes I'll get considerably less. It's always kind of a gamble that way, but it's always a guaranteed sell. So like that's what I do with a lot of my old stuff that it, like I'm not even happy with anymore. It's like old and I just want to I would practically give it away, uh, throw it up on a Facebook auction and somebody will buy it. Um, so yeah, that's another another thing you can do. Another option also to consider is trying to find somebody or something to partner with. You know, there are a lot of organizations out there um, locally around around everyone's town where they're trying to raise money or help out for something. So, like, for example, the library contacted me yesterday asking if I would display some work at a, a book event that they had coming up. However, they asked, you know, that 30% of any sales would go towards the library for a program that they're currently working on. And so that's just another way also, you know, I, I told them I'd be happy to do that because selling something's better than selling nothing. And knowing that I'm helping out the library, you know, is a good thing as well. Other than the fact that we kind of own like part of the library because of all the late fees that we always pay. <laughs> Nice. Right on. Good way to approach that. Our next one comes from Naran Galici, and hopefully I'm not butchering that one. It says, the question is, if I was shooting a full-frame camera, the noise performance at 1600 would be much better, so they say. 
um, but to get the same depth of field on a full frame camera I'd probably have to use an aperture of 5.6 which is four times a 1.5 crop ratio that's on um, Nikon just bear in mind and some other systems but Canon it's 1.6 they decide to be goofy that way that's my little side note and hence the ISO would have to be 1200 can anybody tell me if this is true on a full frame camera um, that it performs better at ISO 1200 compared to 800 on a crop sensor. Um, let's shoot it over to Brian this time. What's your experience? Have you did you dive straight into full frame and not really mess around with crop sensor bodies be, and get annoyed with ISO, or what? What are your thoughts? That's a geek question. <laughs> I, I don't I don't do <laughs> geek questions. Let me, let me I can. Well, I I can tell you that I first started with a crop sensor okay. and. To me, it's more important. Do you know how to take a good photo? I can take a good photo with a crop sensor. I can take a good photo with a full frame, and I don't pay attention to that geeky stuff. To where I'll hand that off to Nick. Well, before <laughs> before Nick jumps in on this, I, I will say that we did have Juan Pons on the episode, and I've been doing a ton of portfolio reviews for improved photography. And when I notice noise, I bring up what what Juan Pons said on your show when you had him on there. He said, if someone notices the noise in a photo then it's probably not that good of a photo to begin with. So if it's really noisy and it's an amazing capture, people are going to overlook the noise and look at the composition and other things that add value to it. So now I'll pass it on to Nick for the geekery. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, the point of this question was they're, they're talking about the depth of field that you lose when you go to full frame. And like if you're, for example, in a dark situation where you're trying to not only freeze the action, but keep your ISO fairly low, um, you have to use a deeper depth of field on a full frame camera to achieve the same amount of depth of field. And so they're asking, um, since I'm going to have to increase my um, ISO, is the ISO performance so much better on a full frame camera that I will be able to use almost double the ISO and not see as much noise as in the crop sensor. Very difficult question to put into words, but I totally understand what, what Naran, Naran is saying. And the answer is, eh, it's pretty close, really. If depth of field is one of the things that you're going to be needing a lot, like if you're shooting landscapes or if you're shooting stuff where you require a deep depth of field and you, ha you don't have the luxury of shooting on a tripod and using longer exposures, then maybe the the crop sensor would be a better camera in that situation. You don't hear Nick Page say that very much, so so write this on your calendar. But I would say that the noise performance is considerably better on a full frame to the point where yes, 1200 ISO is probably probably does look better than 800 ISO on a crop sensor, depending on the crop sensor. Like if we're talking. 5D Mark III versus, I don't know, a 6DD or something, uh, which is probably um, comparable to a D5100. Um, the, the difference is pretty huge, but a 5D Mark III versus a 7D Mark II, the, the difference isn't as much, so it kind of depends. I would say in this situation, you're on the Nikon side, so if you're looking at like a D750, I would say that the noise performance on a D750 would probably make for a cleaner image at a higher ISO in this situation? Man, that's a loaded question, but yeah, that's, that's, what, that's my input. Well, I see the next question is, is geared towards Nick, but I want to give Brian a shot at talking about something because he helped me kind of streamline my process a little bit, and this one came through. It just popped up. It's from Rob Davis, or Rod Davis, and he says, for final sharpening, when toggling back and forth in between Lightroom and Photoshop, when and how do you sharpen? Do you turn off light from sharpening altogether, or what's your approach, Brian? Why are you throwing me these questions? That's another geeky question. <laughs> I don't, honestly, uh, you know. Well, what do you do? Do you sharpen inside Photoshop, Lightroom? I mean, your photos are pretty sharp, so they have to be sharpened somewhere. What's your process? I don't know when the last time was that I ever o opened up Photoshop. Okay. I just I use Lightroom so much for everything. You know, it's most of my workflow for any portrait stuff that I do. Um, I will admit that I do a tiny bit of sharpening in Lightroom, uh, just you know, sliding it over uh, just a couple little spots. But but that's all. I don't I don't do any sharpening in Photoshop. I don't even know how to sharpen in Photoshop. I just try to take pretty pictures, and I think I do okay at that. I think you you're take, pretty proficient. You take very pretty pictures, Brian. Thank you, Nick. Don't let anybody tell you differently. You do. You know, and this is coming from the guy who 
on this video cast right now. Look at the lighting on Nick. <laughs> I mean, even the lighting is beautiful on Nick for this podcast. The way it just goes right. <sighs> Yeah, <laughs> it's because I'm an overachiever. I can't, I can't even do a webcam without like setting up three-point lighting. It's a sad situation. He's got to show off his curves and edges. All right. Yeah. But Next. okay, so let me let me yeah. take this this sharpening question. Let's not walk away from this yet. Um, so I do bounce back and forth between Lightroom and Photoshop pretty often, and one thing that I will do is before I go over to Photoshop from Lightroom. Um, I mask out some of the sharpening um, using the masking feature. Just that way, I'm not trying to sharpen like the sky or you know the water or things that don't really need sharpening. And then I will go over to Photoshop, do all my Photoshop trickery over there, and then I will come back into Lightroom, and then I will do my final sharpening in Lightroom, typically using an adjustment brush and adding a little bit of detail and whatever needs detail. Or I will just use the global sharpening, masking some out again, and adding a little bit um, that way. So that's how I do it. How dare you not sharpen water? I love sharpening I water. Well, <laughs> I like I like sharpening like moving water, but okay. not like smooth still water. And I don't like sharpening like blue skies. Like I hate seeing noise in blue skies and Me grain too. in blue skies. So I, I mask some of that out so I don't see that as much. And I think you're so darn popular because we make fun of you so much on the show, especially with the, S, the Expo Disc thing last time. So Erica um, Schneering asks, I'd love to hear Nick talk about um, selling prints or downloads with Squarespace. Um, is that something that anyone can do? Um, and we probably can't really dive into the legal aspect, but how about the legal and tax aspects to consider? Um, can you walk us through your process for orders, printing, shipping, um, etc.? So... There's been a little bit of a misconception thrown around in, in recent episodes. I was about to set up the, the whole like selling through Squarespace thing, and I never actually succeeded in getting it set up. So I still sell through my Zenfolio. I just like link to my Zenfolio page that has all of my landscape stuff on it. And that's where I'm actually selling from. It's linked to from my Squarespace, Squarespace page. And the reason I don't sell through Squarespace yet is because they don't fulfill the prints like Zenfolio does. What's nice about Zenfolio is somebody orders a print there and they can just have it shipped right to them. I never have to do anything and I mysteriously made money somehow when I check at the end of the month. But um, with Squarespace, I would have to order the prints and I'm far too lazy for that. So... Um, that's why I haven't switched over to it. One of the things I do want to do through Squarespace is actually um, just sell like you know like digital files through Squarespace. That wouldn't be hard to set up. Um, like you could sell you know uh, wallpapers and stuff, um, desktop backgrounds, that kind of thing. So I haven't really done it yet. So that's a pretty poor answer, but. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to clear it up because <laughs> Jim kept saying there for a while because I was going to do it and he just like ran off with it and he was like, yeah, Nick is selling all kinds of stuff through Squarespace and every time I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, so. I'll yeah. try not to say it this go around. Um, <laughs> yeah, and our next question comes in from Michael James Irwin and he says, I like to buy some lenses and I keep looking at the spec sheet from Im for image stabilization and it always says X number of stops. Can you... Define what that means. Nick. I think it's pretty simple. Let's let, let Brian jump into that one. That doesn't sound too geeky, does it, Brian? No, it does. It's image st stabilization stuff. It's a little thing on your lens, and you click it, and you turn it on most of the time. Okay. Now, I, I think that it's a rating, and this Nick can correct me because Nick's the biggest geek because Jeff Harmon has checked out um, for the week, but I my understanding is that the image stabilization, the X number of stops, is what it's rated below the number of stops it can go for one over the shutter speed rule, and that's why Jim was talking when he still shot Nikon that he could shoot that Tamron 15 to 30 millimeter lens like way below the one over the shutter speed because it was rated, I think, 10 stops for image stabilization. What's your interpretation, Nick? Yeah, that's exactly it. it. That means how much can you slow down your shutter speed from what you would normally be able to shoot with the uh, image stabilization off, how much can you slow it down before you start getting blurry pictures? So if it's rated for four stops, that means that you could do 12 clicks with your shutter speed. So you could go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 before you start getting blurry pictures. So, yeah. 
that's that's it. And that that's a nice little thing. That's a little tip for everybody out there, is um, if if you're quickly changing your settings, like oh man, I need a deeper da- a deeper depth of field. So you change your ap- aperture. You just count the clicks. So you go one, two, three. And then if you're shooting the manual, you slow down your shutter speed, one, two, three, and you have the exact same exposure with different settings. So count your clicks, everybody. Cool. And we, we do have one more question, and before we jump to it, I some questions have been coming through on our feed right now, um, just kind of following up with what Nick has been talking about with using Zenfolio. One of them comes from Jeremy Lathorn. He says, um, when you send, Nick, when you send photos to print to Zenfolio, do you do any output sharpening at that point? Um, yeah. The output sharpening that I do coming out of Lightroom, I typically sharpen for screen and only, what is it, medium or mid or something. It's the medium. It's not It's not high. It's not low. It's whatever's in the center. So I do for screen and I do it medium, whatever that was, yeah. Okay, and then also, um, I believe Brian Pex asked. His, he said, "Nick, have you ever used Smug Mug? If so, how does it compare to um, uh, Synfolio?" So the 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 magazine that I shoot for, they use Smug Mug, so I have to deliver everything through Smug Mug. And in a lot of ways, I kind of like it a little. I like the interface better than Zenfolio, but I don't think that it would be as good for like building a website through. The Zenfolio websites aren't too bad. They're not as good as uh, Squarespace, but um, but it's I don't know. I think if I was going to be using it for like a portfolio situation, I would probably go with Zenfolio. But if I was going to do it for client delivery, I would use Pass because Pass is awesome and it's my new thing. Uh, <laughs> so Smug Mug, it, I think the user interface is nicer, but it's it. You know, you, I'm either using Zenfolio to for people to order prints from, or Pass to deliver to clients, or Squarespace for my website. So, yeah. Very cool. Awesome follow-up. And our, our last question before we move on to our five-minute topics is from Susanna Martin. She says, as a hobbyist photographer, I'm struggling with a clean workflow. I love to go out and take a zillion pictures, and um, I'm saving them quickly to post to Facebook or Instagram, but then things get backed up on her card. Um, she has to empty the card real quickly and then chuck everything into a folder, usually name and date, which is useless to her, and they're either on her desktop or whatever is open and handy at the time, and now her photos are all over the place with no clear way of keeping it all neat. I'm fairly new to Lightroom, and I love what it does for processing um, fo- photos, but how do I consolidate so everything's easy to find? I need a system, and I love hearing the filing process you guys follow once you finish a shoot. So, Brian, jump on that one. That doesn't seem too geeky for you. No, I, li- I like that one. That's my type of question. All right. Um, Okay, so Lightroom, I know that when you get in it, you can change the name of the folders. I like to keep it by date because in my mind, I file things through dates. So as I, when I'm done with the shoot, or actually sometimes during the shoot if it's a wedding, I'm uploading the images immediately to Lightroom. As soon as I have all the images on Lightroom, the first thing I would recommend to her is have multiple cards. So then that way you have, you know, one card can sit on the shelf for a while until you're done with everything you need while you're using your other cards. Uh, That's what I do. Usually I've got a handful of extra cards laying around that I keep the pictures on there until I've got it backed up in multiple ways. So then once the images are edited in Lightroom, I do immediately export them. Uh, Usually I'll go through and I'll mark, you know, my system of starring them. And I may, if it's from a wedding, Usually during the wedding, I've uploaded the images, and I do a slideshow at the wedding of my top, like, 20 to 30 favorite images. Because you're a rock star, because that's awesome, Thank and you. you're really fancy. Cool. Well, you know, Anyways, you know, I know some, some people may not like that, but it's, it's always worked, and I've always asked the bride and groom ahead of time. I said, you know, while people are eating, this is kind of what I do, and I've, I've got that system down pretty quickly. And they love it, and it brings me more business, because... People come back to it. Anyways, I'm getting away from the topic. But um, So then when I go home, I've already marked my favorites, so I export those with my logo on it, and then I post those to social media. After I've posted those to social media and I've finished editing all my other photos, I export it, and then uh, when I export it, I export it by whatever the name is of the event. So if it's uh, bride and groom, I put their name on it. Uh, if it's uh, an, 
an NFL game like the Bears versus the Vikings. <laughs> you just rub it in. He just he loves to bring that up. I hate it. Then I then I'll put Bears versus Vikings and and the year that it is, uh, and then at the end once I have them all exported out and saved in their folders. Uh, each year, so for 2015, I have three major folders. One for weddings, uh, one for portraits, and one for events. And then in there, so for 2015 weddings, I have all my weddings. For 2015 events, I have all the events, and then same with portraits. And every single time after I do a shoot, I plug in my external hard drive and it backs it up. So I've got them backed up on an external hard drive. And then also, I upload almost everything I do to pass. I've been using Pass since before it officially came out. I had access to it from the beginning. So from the beginning, I've been using Pass. So really, most of the shoots I have are uploaded on Pass, so that way I have them all right here on my phone to use as a walking portfolio. Uh, they're also backed up on at least one external hard drive, and then they're also on my computer, and then I keep them on that memory card, that the flash card that sits on the shelf until until I need to use it again. But I've got like 20 SD cards and, and flash cards, so I have plenty to where it doesn't hurt for me to leave it up there. Right. Yeah, and, you know, if she's, if the, was it a she? I forget who asked yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah. He talked so long, I forgot who asked the question. Anyways. Oh. Um, <laughs> that was my uh, one chance to talk. If, if they're not using the power of Lightroom... Um, to to organize their photos, it is so powerful in that way. Like Lightroom is really awesome for organizing your photos, making collections, um, keywording so you can find your stuff, and then you know using your star ratings so you can sort through the the you know, sort the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Um, I don't do enough of it, but I'm attempting to do more of it lately. And so if you're not using Lightroom for that, you need to, because Lightroom is so awesome for that. That's like Lightroom's probably strongest, strongest selling point. It's awesome for organizational stuff. Now, do either of you guys use the, uh, the feature of like key, like, you know, keywords? Yes. I do, yeah, I do some, not nearly as much as I should. Um, I do it for, like, um, my landscape stuff. I I typically add keywords to, but, for, like, for all my weddings and portraits and stuff, like, I just, I create a folder. I upload the entire wedding into a single folder in Lightroom. That way I don't need the keyword because the folder is called the keyword, you know. It, it's self-explanatory. I don't need that, so, yeah. Do you ever use smart collections like Jeff Harmon recommends? Because I, I, I've always wanted to pull the trigger on it, but I'm just kind of being lazy in that respect. I mean, do either of you use it? I haven't. No. I don't. I don't. I don't have time to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> That's too nerdy. I don't. No, I just got too much going on. Very cool. All right. Well, we'd like to jump into our round robin segments, and before we do so, we'd like to thank someone who makes makes the Improved Photography Podcast possible, and that is Squarespace. Squarespace helps you create beautifully professionally designed websites, regardless of your skill level. I mean, my dad was actually posting on Facebook to someone that he is in his 60s and he's able to update um, some of the stuff on our website, and our website's finally being updated because he has the time and I don't. It's intuitive, has easy to use tools, and it has the state of art technology for helping you powering your site to enable security, stability, and is trusted by millions of photographers and the most respected brands in the world. It starts at 8 bucks a month, and you get a free domain name when you sign up for a year. Start your free trial today with no credit card required at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up, don't do what I did in the beginning and forget to include the offer code, but enter offer code IMPROVE, that's I-M-P-R-O-V-E, to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace, build it beautiful. All right, let's move on to our five-minute segment. And because Brian said that he hasn't uh, had a, a chance to talk very much, let's actually let Brian do a little bit of talking now. Well, I just got yelled at by Nick for talking a lot already. <laughs> I know, I know, but I, I, I got to keep the dynamic going. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> in in our document that we're sharing here, this is kind of going to just deal with what uh, what mine would be, which, again, is pass. Uh, you know, you guys have mentioned it. Uh, Darren, you're using it, right? Yeah, I just signed up, and I'm really stoked. I actually name-dropped you with customer service when they, they I said, yeah, Brian McGuckin told me to sign up for it, and they're like, cool, we're glad to have you aboard. So I don't know if they know you or not, but yeah. All right, well, I know the guy who created it, so that's how 
He Ooh, knows me. Nobody, hands. But nobody else knows me though, so they're like, "Who's that guy?" Nobody cares about him. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot go on enough about Pass. So I'm just going to say something really quickly about Pass again. Why everyone should be using it. Now, I, I spent a little chunk of money in the beginning, so I have unlimited amount forever, basically. So for me, for you guys, I believe you can upload up to 100 images from an event, and it's free. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. So if you want to go above that, then you pay an additional, is it $29 mm -hmm. yes. a, a month 29. for that? Um, so for, for, uh, for no, when not a, not a month, it's 29 per, per shoot, per shoot that, yeah. is, that is over a hundred. So like in my case, uh, 29 per wedding. Right. Right. Which honestly you build that into the cost of your shoot and it's mm -hmm. basically free for you. And the advantage to pass is it's just unbelievable. It's quick to upload to you share it. Your customers have it all on their phone to where your clients do to where they can sit there and show the pictures to their friends. Say, Hey, look, here's all my wedding photos They're on my phone. And if someone's like, Oh, I want a copy of that. They don't have to say, okay, when I get home, I'll go through my files off my computer and I'll email it to you. They can do it right there. And then from the phone, they can email the copy to them. They can post something straight to Facebook, and it will tag you, the photographer, in that post. Uh, they can order prints. It, there's, it's an easy way to sell prints. A lot of times I have clients ask me, uh, after I've shared the images with them, hey, you know, how can I get some prints? You know, what should I do? And I tell them, well, you have two options, because the way I do it is I just charge what I need to up front. So I tell them, option one, download all the images, print it however you want. I don't recommend you print it locally because we don't have very good printing companies around here, um, except for one company. And then I tell them the other thing is you can order the prints through Pass. They have up to, I believe, 8 by 10s So Pass will pretty much provide anything that you need for the clients. But what I love about it as a photographer is I've got my walking portfolio with me. So I can sit here on my phone, and I'm showing it if you're watching a little bit. And all my shoots are on here from everything that I've shot. It's all up here. So if I'm meeting with somebody, I can show them pictures easily on here. Uh, if we're talking about someone asked me how a trip was somewhere, I can show them pictures from the trip. If someone's like, oh, do you do senior portraits? I don't advertise it, but I can say, yeah, look, let me show you. I've got almost every shoot from the past couple years right here on my phone. And that's an unbelievable portfolio. So Pass is, it's just great if you're not familiar with it. It, you should be, in my opinion. It's yeah. just so easy to share, and it makes you look good, and the images are up there. Now, something to pay attention to is when you upload the files, you can upload, I think there's like two options. Um, one is large file, uh, where it can print up to 8 by 10s pretty easily, and maybe a little bit above that. Uh, and then there's the original, which is the larger size. And they usually say, you know, don't upload that because you don't really need it. However, I do. I don't want a client coming to me later and saying, hey, I tried ordering a picture and it was the file size was too small. You know, where's the original? So I upload the originals so that way they're up there. And it's just another way you have all your photos backed up again. So mm -hmm. it's, it's great. Yeah, I just switched to pass um, probably not even quite a month ago. And I absolutely love it. Like, I, I went from Zenfolio to Pass, and and I was pretty deeply entrenched into Zenfolio because I've been using it for so long. I have tons and tons and tons of shoots up there. So I, I'm going to have to continue to use and, and pay for Zenfolio so people don't lose their photos. But I started using Pass, and for the first three clients or so, I... I actually delivered with both Zenfolio and Pass, and I said, hey, let me know which gallery you like best and which is the easiest for you and, and stuff. And all three people said that Pass was way better for them um, because when, when they first go to their gallery, if they're going to it on their phone, there's a little pop-up that says, hey, download the app. And then when they download the app, it's a super user-friendly um, way for them to have their photos um, I, it's so much easier, in my opinion, to use on my end than Zenfolio. You literally just drag stuff in, it uploads, you do a couple things, and the galleries are really attractive. Um, I love Pass now that I'm using it. And really, like the $29 per shoot, that 
<clears throat> that only happens if you, you upload more than 100 photos. And typically, the only time you deliver more than 100 photos is in a wedding. Most of the time, it's other types of shoots are going to be less than that, typically. So really, $29 is nothing compared to what your profits are in a wedding. And if if it's something that you're worried about, just throw an extra 30 bucks on the price of the wedding and, and call it paid for. So... So, yeah. and, they, and they stay up there for 10 years. And right. at, at the end of 10 years, they will send an email to the client because when you do it, you sign up the client for that. And then the client has a choice if they want to continue for another amount of time or, or not. Right. So it's on them. It's not on us at that point. And they're, they're notified via email, which is nice. But my other question is um, with PASS, uh, so what happens if you shoot an engagement and shoot first for that couple and then shoot a wedding for them second? And you know that the wedding is going to be over 100 photos of what's delivered. Does it just um, separate it by shoot name? So you could say John and Jill's um, engagement shoot, and then that's within 100 photo tolerance, and then you can go over to John and Jill's wedding, and you still have 100 photos within the tolerance, or how does that work? They're separated into what they call events. Okay. So I would just use two separate events for that. That way your engagement shoot is free and the wedding is 29 bucks. Beautiful. So that's the way I would do it. Cool. Well, and since so we... you know, you can go back in and add more pictures to things. So since for me it doesn't matter on the $29, I, I can go into what was the original file that had engagement shoots and I can upload the wedding pictures into there. Right. And for you and I, Darren, that would just be $29 there, and then they would have everything into in one thing. And you can add different, like, collections within the event. So you would have engagement shoot, then you could have getting ready, then you could have, like, ceremony, then you could have reception. You can divide it all into different collections. Um, there's lots of ways to, to do that. But, nice. yeah, I agree. Pass is awesome. Yeah, that might help our, our user who's trying to get an, an easier workflow because once you get it up on pass, I mean, you kind of can just forget about it. Right. And speaking with our round robin segments, I mean, pass was a great thing to discuss because it's something that the three of us are using and loving. But what is something that you've been doing lately, Nick? I, I know that I'm kind of segueing into this, but something <laughs> you want to talk about this week with your round robin because you've been doing it so darn much and doing it quite well, I must say. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I've... Okay, so I live in southeastern Washington, which if you have turned on the news at all, you know that it's like literally on fire. fire. I'm completely surrounded by flames and smoke. The entire the entire northwest is just on fire. It's it's really like epic proportions. And with epic amounts of fire come epic amounts of smoke. And with epic amounts of smoke comes really crappy skies because Every time that I go out to do a photo shoot, it's like, oh, great, it's still gray and smoky, and and I have a cough because of it. So not you can't always just go out and shoot when the weather is perfect and amazing and I'm getting these amazing sunsets. Lately, I've had been having to do these photo shoots for one of my clients, which is actually a winemaker, and they have these vineyards that they need these very nice, pretty, scenic photos of, and they, they needed them... Um, like pronto because they're about to start their harvest of their grapes and once they do that the, the place is trashed and right now the skies suck and there's like no sunsets. The sunsets just don't happen right now because my world is on fire so I had to do something and so I've been doing some sky replacement. I've, I've been doing it in some of my portrait work and I'm sad to say that I've had to do it in some of my landscape work as well um, but for in this particular situation, it worked really well because I I did I didn't have more time to wait for a good sky. I just had to make it work. So I took a shot of this this pretty vineyard with this dull sky, and then I went back into my catalog and I found a sky that I felt like would look realistic, and then I just blended it in. So and I think I'm gonna do a photo taco on how I blended it in. I think that would be a good episode for photo taco. So. <clears throat> that was a situation where I, I've recently been doing sky replacements. Um, like I said, I've been doing it in some of my portrait work as well. Um, there, sometimes I do these big, um, these big landscapey environmental portrait type shots, like for my seniors and stuff. And, and one of the things I enjoy doing is is blending in this really pretty sunset 
when it was kind of impossible to even get it. Like, if you're having this overcast day, if you're having this overcast day, um, <laughs> you, uh, you have this nice flattering light on the subject, but the sky is typically boring. So if you have this nice flattering light on your subject and then you blend in a nice um, sunset from another shoot, it, it just makes the entire shot so much more vivid and interesting, adds in all this color. And then the, the other other time that I've been doing uh, um, sky replacements is when I go on this big long road trip and I have one opportunity to get this shot and I get there and it's like overcast or the light sucks or there's no sunset. So I'm like, you know what? I drove all this way. I'm going home with a photo of this lighthouse no matter what. So I will go home and I will put in a sky where there is actually no interesting sky. And it's kind of a, a moral dilemma because I'm, I don't like doing it in my landscape work because I don't want people to think that my stuff is just photoshopped and fake. And I'm afraid that if I do too much of that, people will um, not trust my photography. So I, I only do that on rare occasion. And when I do, I typically say something like, yeah, and um, this is a blender, blend of two different, two different photos. Or I, I will say something about that because I worry that people will not trust my, my um, photography if I do too much of that. So yeah, sky replacement. I've been doing it and... I'm conflicted on it. So, how much yeah. how much time do you spend on one photo? Like for the portraits, the senior portraits, how much time will you spend on one photo of replacing the sky? I can do like a sky replaced landscape shot in probably like two to three minutes, something like that. So not too much time. And so how many photos would you go through and do that for seniors? Do you do it to every photo? No, no. Like I, Because the majority of your portraits, they're like you know, close-ups and stuff where the sky doesn't even matter. But occasionally I like to throw in, like, the big the big landscape environmental portrait where they're like, oh, look, look how small and cute they are. They're like this tiny little thing in this big mm. pretty frame. So I will do, like, at the most, like, four or five of those per shoot. I'll do the, okay. the big sky replacement job. So it adds a little bit of time, but the amount of aesthetic appeal that it adds is pretty huge. So... I feel like I get my money's worth for my time. And it's definitely tricky because wherever the sky meets the tree line mm -hmm. or whatever, I mean, especially with trees, that's the hard part is trying to get right. that. And you've got, don't you have a video tutorial on how to do that? I don't. Well, nope, there you that's, go. That's, that's, your that's one of my secrets. You want to know that, you're oh, going to have to pay for that. No, I think um, my next photo, Taco, I'm going to go into depth about like some of the things that I do in my sky replacements. Because I, I have been getting a lot of questions about that, and there are definitely some tricks to it. So so stay tuned for photo, Taco, because I'll, I'll, I'll reveal all. Well, cool. I'm going to make mine um, kind of short, but mine's just a, a quick tip to get out there and shoot before you need your mittens. In other words, before it gets cold out. Um, summer's coming to an end here in the Northern Hemisphere, and if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, like I know that we have some people from Australia listening in because um, they've chimed in on our Facebook page, start planning out what you're going to do during the warmer season. I mean, when you're able to go outside, usually sometimes if you're a wuss and you need to have a Fuji X-T1 um, to, as an excuse uh, for a lighter camera it, to not leave it at home, that's fine. But, I mean, it's so much fun to go outside and, you know, do sports. I cycle a lot. Um, people go fishing. They camp. They do all these fun things, but they leave their camera behind. And then the season comes to an end, and they say, oh, crud, now it's really cold outside, and I really don't want to go outside for a reason, and I wish I wouldn't have wasted my summer. So in order to stay sharp with your photos and keep on top of um, creating new work and keep staying creative, I say go out there and find reasons to shoot. Find a meteor shower. There's one of those a couple weeks ago. Um, in 2017, I know that's two years from now, but plan to do it. There's going to be, a, in North America, there's going to be a solar eclipse. Jeff Harmon's already sent us a message because he's a huge geek as well, and he said, we need to plan something for this. So hopefully improved photography will do something for that uh, solar eclipse that's going to happen in 2017. But just get out there and shoot. I think that if your camera's sitting there collecting dust, it's almost as detrimental as having old pictures sitting on your hard drive collecting dust, and you're not going to get any better by sitting around and just listening to podcasts. We love having you listen to the podcast, but get out there and shoot. 
We mean, yes, you are going to get better by sitting around and listening to podcasts. That's what <laughs> we mean to say. To shoot. Yeah, yep. but you need to shoot, right? I mean, yes. yeah, you need to put it to practice. And then also, um, since I have two of the, of the four people who will be joining us in China um, are joining Jim in China in 2016, um, please check out improvephotography.com slash China for our upcoming workshop in China. It's going to be an amazing experience. It's an adventure. Um, the tour guides who take us around there know the place. They know photography perspectives. They'll actually set up their camera on a tripod and say, hey, what do you think about this composition? They kind of spark that creativity in you and you're going to come home with beautiful, amazing images. And also, with all the people who have been supporting us in the Facebook group, check out Facebook and look for Improved Photography Podcast on Facebook. We're not, at, we're not advertising this on the Improved Photography website or on the Improved Photography Facebook page, which is separate, but we just want you to be able to interact with us, ask questions, and get updates on how you can improve your photography skills. But before we go, we always like to leave you with a dude out of the week. Let's hand it over to Brian first. So I'm going to China, and I'm stoked about that. I yeah. The first time I actually officially get to meet Nick. Hopefully <laughs> not. Hopefully it'll be before that. But uh, so I'm also a teacher, and I have I live in a community where we get a lot of people moving to our area for the school system, and we have a lot every year. There's usually a couple students that their native language is Chinese. So I currently have a Chinese student, doesn't understand a lick of English, so trying to communicate with him is kind of tricky. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to be going to China pretty soon, so I'm going to try to learn some Chinese. And through that, I came across uh, an app, it's just Google Translate, but it's unbelievable. It, it has changed now what I'm able to do in the classroom, because I'm sitting there talking with a kid, and I can speak English into, into my phone, and it will convert it into the text for him to read in Chinese, and then I can press play, and it will say it to him. So he can read it and also hear it, and then he can respond back. Also, I could take pictures of any text, so like a worksheet that I'm using, or if we're in China and we're trying to read something at the airport, and it will highlight it all, and then you run your finger over it, and it will translate it immediately for you. And it also works with handwriting, so I can write a note take a picture of my note, run my finger over the words, it will then translate those words into Chinese. And then I also have a student who sits right next to him who speaks Hindi uh, back at, at home. And so all I had to do was sit there and change from Chinese to Hindi, and I didn't have to re-say anything, but it, it translated all of it into Hindi. And I asked her, I said, is this accurate? And she's like, yeah, for the most part it is. So I'm just stoked about having that because, Nick, you and I, we're going to go and we're going to get lost in China <laughs> on purpose, <laughs> on purpose. And we're going to be we're going to spend all of our time on our cell phone, like, taking <laughs> pictures of signs. Like. <laughs> unless, unless the app is blocked when we're there because it's Google. I don't know if China blocks Google, but... Yeah. It works. So Google Translate is an awesome app for anyone who's ever around any other type of language. Very cool. Yeah. Cool. And I wonder uh, if it has Icelandic. We need to go back to Iceland and, and try that there. I think that's a good excuse to go back to Iceland. Good thing so you brought Jim, that up. Jim, we need to do a photo workshop in Iceland when you're hearing this. Yep. All right. And Nick, what's your doodad of the week? <clears throat> My doodad of the week is the Peak Design hand clutch strap for your camera. Um, I used to use... Uh, uh, black rapid straps like all the time and lately I've been on this no strap kick I, I'm just tired of straps so I got this I got this uh, hand strap here and what's cool about it is it's got this clutch design where it, it, it connects to the connects to the strap on top of your camera the the strap uh, loop I guess yeah. you'd call it and then it'll also connect to the bottom of your quick release plate and so it goes around your hand when, it, when you're grabbing your camera normally. And it's got this quick clutch to where I can pull it tight and then I can walk around with it and totally not worry about it falling out of my hand. And then when I go to use it, I can just quickly go um, release the quick uh, clutch and start taking pictures and, and I'm good to go. It's really fast. It's really handy. And um, I just got it today, so I don't know how well I like it, but I'm going to give it a try. It's the Peak Design Quick Clutch Hand Strap thing. 
So that's what it is. <laughs> there will be a link in the show notes. So Forty dollars. Yeah, it's pretty cheap. Don't take my word for it. Read the book. Read the book. Well, and my question is, when you, when I was kind of looking at it, is you said it goes to your quick release plate. So when you're doing tripod shots, is it easy to remove? Uh, you don't have to remove it. You just leave oh. it on because Very it cool. it does not get in the way of your quick release plate. You can just mount it, and and that's another thing that was always annoying is I would have to either be using my my uh, Black Rapid strap, and then I'd have to unscrew that and then put a quick release plate on, and that got really annoying. But with this, um, I won't have to take anything off. Plus, you don't have this big strap hanging from your camera when you're on a tripod because your strap blowing in the wind is not a good thing. It's, it's only going to make for blurry shots, so this is not going to blow in the wind. So hopefully it's something that I can leave on my camera and won't be too annoying. Yeah, that thing kicks butt. It kicks butt over the cotton carrier thing that I recommended, so I'll have to check it out after we find out whether you truly like it or not because yeah. we've gone there before whether Nick truly likes things or not. <laughs> yeah, we, um, won't, we, won't, we won't mention the Expo Disc. I wasn't even going to say the name. <laughs> All right. Before we, we let you go, mine is just kind of something simple. Mine's comfortable shoes. Um, I was out shooting photos with Brian and Jim in Chicago, and I noticed there was a lot of times when I was sitting on my duff and, and Brian's kind of like trying to cheer me up, like, hey, Darren, walk around, do something, you know, hold a flash. And it was because I was wearing uncomfortable shoes. So I say find the best shoes out there for you. I think that um, we've probably heard other landscape photographers talk about this, but if you're doing any type of photography photo walks or just walking around in nature, find some shoes because you don't want to have your dogs barking at the end of the day, which is an Americanism for your feet hurting, uh, because it could be what divides you from getting a beautiful shot. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining me, Brian and Mr. Nick Page. And Brian has a last name, too. It's Brian McGuckin. You can follow him at Brian McGuckin on Instagram. And he's trying to catch up to Nick Page and followers. Mine's kind of crazy. It's Darren TM08 or Starchild43, as Jim Harmer would say. We can't wait to have Jim back on the show. But follow us on Instagram. Check out the Facebook page for Improved Photography. And we really appreciate the download. We'll see you again in another seven days.